According to numerous accounts, cholera has existed in India since antiquity and originated in the warm and brackish water of the Bay of Bengal. At the turn of the 16th century, a Portuguese officer returning from the Indies brought back a chronicle of his travels and fear of a terrible scourge engulfed the old continent. In 1817, the first cholera pandemic marked the beginning of a new era. From India, where it originated, the disease followed trade routes to reach all four corners of the globe. Arriving in London in 1832, in the middle of the Industrial Revolution, 7,000 people died of cholera. That same year, it was the turn of New York, and at the peak of the epidemic, 100 people a day were dying of the disease. The seventh pandemic began in South Asia in 1961, hit Africa in 1971, then South America in 1991, before moving on to its latest victims in Haiti in 2010. In 1831, Alexandre Moreau de Jeunesse was alone in maintaining that the disease was caused by a germ. In 1849, John Snow, a physician and the founder of modern-day epidemiology, suspected that it was spread via water distribution networks. Three years later, London decided as a precautionary measure that the city's water would be filtered through sand before being distributed, a method that still proves effective today. In the second half of the 19th century, many scholars of all nationalities examined Vibrio cholerae, a comma-shaped bacteria which causes the disease. In 1854, the Italian Filippo Pacini isolated the bacteria. Thirty years later, Robert Koch, the German physician famous for discovering the tuberculosis bacteria, took all the credit for showing that the comma-shaped bacteria is indeed the cause of the disease. The first effective treatments were the work of Englishman Leonard Rogers, who developed an intravenous rehydration solution in India. The drop in mortality rates was spectacular. Meanwhile, in Marseille, chlorinating the water supply halted the spread of the epidemic. A century later, in the 1950s, biologists showed that the bacteria produced a toxin. This discovery led to the development of oral rehydration therapy, still the most commonly used today. The cholera bacterium is present primarily in wastewater and human excreta. The disease breaks out where there is poor hygiene, earning it its nickname, the dirty hands disease. It's estimated that cholera affects between 3 and 5 million people annually and kills about 100,000. Cholera strikes in pandemics and affects large areas. There have been seven pandemics, the last of which began in 1961 and is still active today. Cholera is endemic in many countries, which means it is constantly present. But the statistics are imprecise and the World Health Organization, or WHO, estimates that cholera cases reported by countries represent only 5 to 10 percent of the reality. India and Bangladesh, which are believed to have the largest number of annual cases, do not declare their numbers to the WHO. In 2012, the worst affected countries were Haiti, Sierra Leone, Democratic Republic of Congo, and Somalia. The disease is most common in Africa and East Asia, where the highest case fatality rates are found. In other words, the highest percentage of deaths compared to the number of cases. Conflicts and massive refugee displacements fuel epidemics, and it is estimated that in 1994, cholera killed in just a few weeks close to 25,000 Rwandan refugees in Congo. The recent case of Haiti 
has caused a lot of ink to flow. No trace of the bacterium, the cholera vibrion, had been seen in Haiti for over a hundred years. In 2010, nine months after the earthquake hit Port-au-Prince, an epidemic broke out in the north of the country. An investigation revealed that the contamination might have originated in a United Nations Nepalese peacekeepers camp, where wastewater was disposed of into the Artibonit, Haiti's biggest river. The epidemic spread quickly. On November 1st, many people living in the north went south to visit their families in Port-au-Prince. And on November 8th, cholera erupted in the capital. The strain causing cholera in Haiti originated in Bangladesh in the 1990s and is far more virulent than the usual strain. It may well be the start of a new pandemic. Vibrio cholerae is a comma-shaped bacterium that causes cholera. Like most Vibrio bacteria, it is extremely mobile and moves and multiplies at great speed in water. The Vibrio hides in the stools of healthy carriers, as well as the sick and convalescent. It can linger in the body like this for 7 to 14 days. In endemic areas, healthy carriers far exceed the number of people actually suffering from the disease. So humans are both breeding grounds and a means of spreading the Vibrio. By drinking water contaminated with human feces carrying cholera, we can unknowingly invite an entire army of Vibrios into our stomachs. In most cases, people carrying the Vibrio show no symptoms, either because the cholera bacterium cannot survive the acid conditions in the stomach, which act as a barrier, or because the immune system has fulfilled its role. Contamination also depends on quantity, as vast amounts of Vibrios must be ingested for someone to get sick. After passing through the stomach, the Vibrio multiply in the small intestine and secrete a toxin, which provokes a series of biochemical reactions. This results in watery diarrhea, sometimes called rice water stools, and severe vomiting. These initial symptoms appear between a few hours and a few days after ingesting the bacteria. Dehydration can be dramatic. An infected person can lose up to 15 liters of fluid a day, which results in the loss of essential micronutrients, a sharp drop in blood pressure, and death. As the bacterium stays in the body for only a short time, it is more important for the doctor to focus on rehydrating the patient than attempting to get rid of the Vibrio. Patients recover incredibly fast, sometimes within hours, having literally been at death's door. Cholera is easy to treat, but it hits so quickly and with such force, the challenge is to stay ahead of it. In 25 to 50 percent of cases without treatment, the patient's blood pressure drops rapidly and they can die within hours. Here is a patient who's just arrived. He's pretty lethargic. We just inserted an IV. He's beginning to open his eyes. But when he arrived, his extremities were very cold, and we couldn't feel his pulse. At the very beginning of an epidemic, you have to set up one or more cholera treatment centers, CTCs. CTCs have three main patient areas, observation, hospitalization, and convalescence. A marked circuit shows the entrance for the patients and their caregivers. There's a staff zone which includes laundry and supplies, a waste management zone, and a morgue. In CTCs, vast volumes of 
chlorinated water are available, to clean the floor and to wash hands and feet. In order to prevent further contamination, patients follow a fixed circuit through the CTC. Treatment is based on rehydration. 80% of patients can be treated with oral rehydration. Intravenous fluid is only used if the patient is severely dehydrated. Improvement is seen within hours and full recovery without any after effects within days. Alongside treatment, the environment must be clean. Clean latrines and chlorinated drinking water are priorities. The use of cholera treatment centers during epidemics can help keep the case fatality below 1%. In addition, antibiotics are used to reduce the quantity and duration of diarrhea, reduce the necessary volume of rehydration solutions, and speed up the elimination of the bacteria from the body. To prevent the development of antibiotic resistance, mass antibiotic use is limited. Cholera vaccines are considered a complementary activity in the control of cholera. Two vaccines are available, which provide, on average, 65% protection, one of them for at least five years. They're both two-dose oral vaccines. Although organizing a mass vaccination campaign during an epidemic requires significant resources, vaccination can help reduce the total number of cases. Cholera is a very old disease, like the plague. They're what we refer to as the great scourges of humanity. Everyone knows cholera. Across the world, cholera is still a common disease. There is still a fairly significant number of deaths from cholera. The World Health Organization estimates that there are 4 to 5 million cases of cholera and between 120 and 140,000 deaths per year. The disease is caused by a pathogen that we know, but which we have to monitor, as it's a pathogen that has a significant capacity to evolve. More specifically, it can become more virulent. It can also develop antibiotic resistance, increasingly so, in fact, over the past few years. Treatment is through rehydration, either orally or with an infusion. In fact, it's essentially a logistics challenge, because to provide effective treatment, you need to be present, which requires significant logistics, which are often lacking in countries that experience cholera epidemics, making it more difficult. One of the projects for the future is to improve the vaccine. We need to develop a vaccine that protects for a longer period of time and that can be delivered in one dose. It would improve protection for populations and would reduce the logistics necessary to deliver the vaccine. It would also reduce the cost of vaccination. One of the other topics to explore, or areas to develop in the field of cholera control, is to improve diagnosis. Currently, in addition to laboratory diagnosis, there are rapid diagnostic tests. A number of them are already on the market are commercially available and are used in the field. But for now, the results are mixed. Let's say these diagnostic tests aren't sufficiently reliable. So another thing to develop in the next few years, as quickly as possible, are new rapid diagnostic tests that can be used by untrained staff and that would improve the prevention and the control of epidemics. <laughs>